Hi Compounders, time for another stock analysis. Today we want to cover Netflix. Uh, let's look at the valuation sheet. This is Netflix now, NFLX. I used to have a subscription, I don't have it anymore. The current price is $240 per share. There are almost half a billion shares outstanding. And they have $6 billion in cash and $14.5 billion in total debt. So this is usually something that we don't like. And of course they have an arrow mode. They have an arrow mode because there are so many other streaming services, right? That can do kind of the same. Of course, the offers might differ a little bit. The subscription model is impressive. It works for many companies, but of course, Netflix is, is not the only one who has this subscription model. And we have seen these models uh, being very successful also for other markets, right, Guy? I mean, this is uh, working for software like Microsoft, Adobe. It's very good in general to have a subscription-based model, but then we have to analyze the switching cost. If Microsoft or Salesforce gives you a service where you become part of the ecosystem, and so it's very difficult then to, to escape from it, then it, that's a very good uh, business model. But in the case of Netflix, it doesn't cost uh, anything to, to switch to a competitor. We also see that the return on assets is actually not so bad in the past. It's been averaging around 9%. So it's right there at the limit where we would like to see it. And then they, they have a return on total capital of around 14% and return on equity of 24%. And so now I will actually ask Guy what he thinks about Netflix and also what he thinks about the earnings power value model. There are a few issues with the analysis of Netflix. The first issue is that they are turning from a model based on growth to a model based on profit. So they have to focus on profits now because growing more than before became essentially impossible. And so essentially the company is, has to turn around. And why do we care? Because all the lagging indicators that we have, like past growth, past margins and so on, may not be representative of the future. And so this complicates the analysis, right? The second issue is that the cash flow generation of Netflix is very unstable and unpredictable. And so this creates a lot of problems for us because we are driven by quantitative data and uh, cash flow is uh, an essential part of our analysis. I wanted to stating these two issues up front because then uh, some analysis, since it's essentially based on uh, the past, may suggest that the stock is undervalued. So the earnings power value model, for example, tells us that the stock is quite undervalued. We, we start from the revenue per share, or regressed in the sense that we analyze more or less if the current revenues are representative of, of a normal trend. In this case, it's, it's more or less true. And then we use the operating margin to, to find more or less what is the operating profit of the company. So here, by the way, the, the box is, is red because this operating margin is the one reported on value line. But then if you look at other services, the operating margin is different. So I think that uh, they compute what it means to be operating a margin for, for this stock in particular. It doesn't really matter for us because in the end, it's sufficient to be consistent. So let's look at this from a conceptual level. So we get the operating profit and we can, we can compute the, this quantity, no part. So no part means net operating profit after tax, which is more or less like the earnings power. It's more or less like earnings in uh, the PE, right? But it, it's before taxes and it's operating. So you remove, you know, depreciation and amortization that is non-cash. So this is actually what, what the company really is capable of. And uh, you divide no part by the WAC the weighted average cost of capital, essentially you are capitalizing this number. You are saying, how much does it cost to buy a share of this company that will give me this NOPAT, $33 forever, so without assuming growth, but forever, like uh, an infinite coupon for a bond. But then you discount it at 8%. So you, you do 33 more or less divided by 8% and it's 400. And then you say, okay, what's the price of the stock? Well, the price is 240 now. So 240 is much less than 400. So the earnings power value model says, oh, maybe, maybe this is undervalued. But what, what's the, the problem in doing this now with, with Netflix in particular is that we have to assume that this nobody is, is stable. 
right? Because when we assume that it's, it's constant forever. The company had uh, problems with growth. And so the, the question to ask is, will they be capable of maintaining their operating margin and their uh, revenue as they are now? So based on this, maybe it's undervalued. But if we think that they are actually going down, then this is not true. And then we enter in the usual value investing discussion about the margin of safety. So what I can point out is that recently they are becoming more profitable in terms of earnings. So this is actually quite good because they are reporting earnings that are higher than before while the stock price is going down. But then uh, when, when we go to, to the discounted uh, cash flow model, then I, I will show that uh, I'm very concerned, actually, because earnings, we know that it's not cash. Yes. So if we look at the multiple base model and we start as usual with the fundamentals, we see that Netflix has had huge growth in the, in the last five, 10 years. We, we can see that on average revenue per share has been growing at 24%, cash flow per share at 34%, and earnings per share at 32%. And the multiples have been pretty large. I mean, you, you can see here the P ratio has been averaging 60, price to cash flow has been averaging around 50, and the price to revenue around 7. And lately, these multiples, due to the two big drops that we have just talked about with Guy, have been more normal. So, for example, the P ratio is around 21, the price to cash flow around 6, and the price to revenue around 3. And Guy here, I mean, actually is forecasting strong growth. I mean, of course, still smaller than consensus, but for, for such a company facing this uncertainty, I mean, 8% in revenue growth is not so bad. At least this is what I think. Of course, as you can see here, and Guy, as, as he said, he will talk more about this. There are some issues and earnings per share growing at 4% maybe might be a bit too small. If we look more at the multiple that is forecasting, of course, is talking about a certain compression in terms of P-E ratio, for example, but then not as much in terms of price to cash flow and price to revenue. And all in all, if you, if you consider these numbers and you perform a multiple based model valuation, you get a CAGR of around 7%. And the Netflix, of course, is not paying any dividends, so this is the CAGR that you get. There is a wide consensus on domestic and international growth around... 6% domestic from Morningstar, at least, and uh, about, uh, let's say, between 8 and and 15% internationally. Uh, so 10% in Europe, 8% in Latin America, 17% in Asia Pacific. So actually, there is a consensus on, on growth. The year-to-date stock performance was just due to unrealistic expectations based on the past. And on its own, I think that it's not so bad now. So this is why the, the multiples model suggests a reasonable CAGR. So if we go straight to the DCF, I tried to look at the numbers from the point of view of getting somehow a high CAGR, and it, it didn't work out. So I, I did this with BABA, if you remember, right? That uh, sometimes when I am not confident about something, I just try to be less conservative. And if the CAGR is disappointing, then I pretty much know that there's no way I'm going to invest in something like this. This is more or less what I did here. Uh, as, as I said, the operating margin that Value Line reports is different than others because they adjust the numbers. So here I adjusted the operating cash flow in a way that the free cash flow is the one that I can read on other services. So the free cash flow per share is more or less about $6, maybe a little bit more or a little bit less, but about this much. Even if I assume that uh, they will grow their debt a little bit, the, the free cash flow will not go much higher than this. By assuming the same, that, that's the point, by assuming the same growth trajectory, more or less, that uh, we assume in the multiples based model, we get very disappointing CAGRs. And if I look at um, the past performance of the company uh, in terms of free cash flow, actually, it's extremely concerning, I have to say, because they have been free cash flow negative since ever, maybe, uh, but surely since 2012, uh, with the only exception of 2020. Maybe they are free cash flow positive now in the last few months uh, because probably they are pivoting into you know, uh, becoming a more cash flow positive company. But this is very concerning. And it's not just a matter of free cash flow because of high capital expenditure. It's also the operating cash flow that has been negative for many, many years. 
I, I think that it was Charlie Munger saying saying this uh, about IPOs, you know, uh, uh, saying something like, uh, I have better things to do than invest in something that loses money every year. In this case, it's really not clear where this is going. In some sense, either this is the very beginning of very, very long run for Netflix. And so they grew so much. Uh, they are okay, free cash flow negative. But the moment they decide to become profitable, they will become super profitable. And in the last few years, actually, the returns on you know, asset equity went up. So there's some hint that this may be the case. From another point of view, I mean, what's the margin of safety? And I don't see any margin of safety. Since the multiple base model is relatively disappointing, since the cash flow generation is not stable enough for me to say anything about the future, I would say that uh, Netflix is at least for me, then tell me what you think, but at least for me, it's something that we can continue to look at, but it should change business model. And maybe this is something that they are doing with this ad-based subscription, right? That they will probably start offering in a while. Yeah, I think it's an easy pass, <laughs> at least for now. It's one of those examples where it's clear that it's maybe too hard to understand, right? So it goes into right. the, the pie that is too hard. I think also, as Warren says, I mean, you don't have to strike all the times. So this is a company that you could consider investing in, but no one is forcing you to, to invest in Netflix. And personally, I think that somehow, even though it's different, Google with YouTube is offering a much more powerful system. Like they're not, of course, doing documentaries. Of course, I mean, you can find documentaries from creators, right? I mean, there are, there are these YouTube channels that have grown so much that are basically providing you with very high quality film and movies and documentaries and uh, info that sometimes even before I ended my subscription, I, I was finding myself watching more YouTube than Netflix. And then I think Netflix has also many competitors, right? There's Apple TV. I, I don't know actually how strong that is, but I think they're growing. And then there's Disney, right? Disney Plus and all those other, uh, other platforms. So for me, I think unless, as you said, something changes that will really in a way strikes us and, and let us think that basically Netflix is becoming the king of streaming platforms, I think that it's an easy pass. I mean, we don't have to be necessarily right exposed to, to Netflix. Yeah. And again, with something like YouTube through Google, I think you kind of have some exposure also to, to that world, more or less. And we, we, we just analyzed Google some time ago, right, Guy? And basically, YouTube could be another company, right? Sometimes it's, uh, it's similar to when we talk about Amazon and AWS, you can, you could easily see these two being two different, very profitable companies. I think in, maybe in the case of Amazon, the retail based business is not as pro profitable as Google minus YouTube, but I think it's an easy example of where you find actually companies that are really doing so much better than other companies. Um, yes. If, if you look at uh, only the revenue, of YouTube is 28 billions. The revenue of Netflix is 29 billions. So YouTube is actually as large as Netflix in terms of revenue, uh, at least. Yeah, and it's kind of baked into so powerful engine that is Google that I really see it as something that can explode even more in the future. Like we are not sure about what's going to happen with YouTube, right? So in 10 years, YouTube might be some sort of YouTube and Netflix together. Who knows? They might, you know, because they already have these ads that, that now Netflix is considering. And they also have now a subscription based model, which is YouTube premium, I think. So I, I don't think it's so unlikely to see these kind of things happening to YouTube. And I think you can already watch movies. On, on YouTube, there are some movies that you can buy and you can watch them on YouTube and the same is happening for Amazon Prime. So I don't know, I, I think the competition is, is very strong. The very big difference is that uh, Netflix produces part of the content, right? While YouTube doesn't. Sure, this can be, I mean, this can have pros and cons though, right? Because right, right. For the business, it's, uh, it's actually, it may be a problem because these series is, uh, and movies are extremely expensive. Because I kind of like the business model of YouTube, and I'm not saying this because we are on YouTube now, but the fact that they count on creators and if the creators become successful is very good for both the creators and YouTube. And indeed, you do split the AdSense in two, right? It's more or less 
50-50. 50% goes to YouTube and 50% goes to the creator. In this way, I think you really have this kind of strong partnership in a way where you don't want to succeed and kind of leave YouTube because you kind of need that platform. And YouTube also needs you to grow together with you. And so I think that there is kind of a, a, a strong business model and uh, together, you know, with the fact that then it's baked into Google and therefore it, it's kind of creating this dependency, right? Like Apple with their ecosystem. It was Charlie Munger saying that you want to invest in some business with a win-win-win model. So win for everybody, like shareholders, the company and the customers, right? So YouTube is actually like this because the customer doesn't pay anything or i don't know youtube premium but probably much less than the netflix and, and it gets content from the point of view of netflix actually they they provide content uh, in part at least and this is in some sense bad for shareholders because they they have to spend money it's very good for the people who subscribe right because Sometimes this, uh, this content is amazing, but yeah, in terms of the business model, then how much you can monetize this content. Sometimes I, I thought, okay, the content is so good that you should pay more. Sometimes, yes. Sometimes you, you can also find yourself disappointed. I have many okay. experiences like that where I was, you know, skimming through Netflix and I wasn't really finding anything that was so, so interesting. Okay. But it's, you know, it's all subjective, right? And the fact that I never really liked about Netflix, which is actually a strong difference with YouTube, actually are two things. So YouTube has that creates this community. So this relationship between creators and subscribers can be actually a very strong drive for, for the platform in itself and for the creators and for the shareholders, as you said, and so on. And this is definitely missing on platforms like Netflix. The other thing that has always been annoying me about Netflix is that the content that is available to you changes depending on your location. And so sometimes there are people using VPN, like NordVPN and these kind of other systems, to be able to watch content that is only available, for example, in the US, but maybe now you are traveling and you are in, uh, in Italy or in France, or maybe you are in France and you do really want to see that movie or that TV show that is only available in the US. But why can't you make it available to everyone? I mean, I know why there are copyright issues and, and it would be a cost. But you know, the, the, the amazing fact about YouTube is that wherever you are, YouTube doesn't change. It's always the same offer. You can watch Compagni with Guy and Matt from anywhere in the world. So before uh, actually closing this video, what about Value Line? Right, so Value Line expects huge annual total returns between 20 and 30%. I, I just think that they are extrapolating, or the consensus is extrapolating the past. So Morningstar actually has always reported the stock as overvalued for many years. Only after the second drop, now around the $200, uh, the stock became slightly undervalued. And what about Everything Money, guy? Everything Money, they report three cases as usual. I think that they see that the stock is more risky because they ask 15% return. The results also here are very spread out all over the place between 40, uh, about $40 a share and 160 So, compounders, thanks for watching until the end. If you think that this is bringing value, you can consider subscribing. And let us know in the comments if you want us to talk about something else. As, as I said also in the past, we're going to keep going with more interviews, with more videos about the portfolios and with more general videos about how we navigate through stock picking and now also the bear market. Thanks for watching and uh, we're going to see you in the next video. Bye.